and verse 14, uh, Job asked a couple of questions there, and those two very important questions. A lot of very important questions in the book of Job, those two are the most important ones. And in Job chapter 14, verse 10, he says, Man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? Now, that's the problem. The fellow dies, and then where is he? Like a fellow said down the south, he's somewhere. And then on down there in verse 14, it says, If a man die, shall he live again? Now, when you stop think about it and analyze it and study it, you'll find out the Bible is the only book in the world that lets a man know absolutely for certain where he's going when he dies. We hear this, this talk about other religions and other religious scripture and this and that, but other religious scripture from all the other religions of the world have one thing in common, and that is the fellows who wrote them don't know what they're talking about. And the proof is they can't let you know where you're going to go when you die. Now, we had in this building here this morning uh, four or five Mohammedans and two or three Confucianists, a couple of Taoists and four or five Buddhists, and a couple of Orthodox Jews and four or five Roman Catholics, a couple of Protestants. I wouldn't say anything different what I'm going to say. What I'm going to say is this. If you don't know where you go when you die, you're reading the wrong books. Amen. There's a book that can let you know where you go when you die. You say, I don't believe that. Well, if you don't believe it, you haven't got any sense. And the proof you haven't got any sense is the fact that you don't know. You ask your fellow, where are you going to die? You don't know. Why don't you know? I mean, the idea of a 20th century intelligent, educated man not knowing where he's going when he dies. What kind of a crackpot are you, man? Why, there are people, in this, uh, people here in this church, 10, 11, 12 years old, know where they're going when they die. You say, well, they're just kids and this and that. No, you got that thing wrong. John was a grown man, and John said, These things have written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. So you got that wrong. Simon Peter says, Knowing I must short, shortly put up this tabernacle, the Lord has showed me, and I've got an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for me. So you got that wrong. You see, Paul said, I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded as able to keep that which I have committed against that day. You got it wrong. That's your problem. David said, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Job said, I know my Redeemer liveth, and the latter day you shall stand upon the earth, and I shall see him. It isn't just the ten-year-old kids. See? Now, that Bible is the only book in the world that lets you know for certain where you're going to go when you die. And if you don't know where you're going for certain when you die, there's something wrong with your bookshelf. Now, if you have uh, the Koran by uh, uh, Muhammad, supposedly, then of course you can't know for sure where you're going when you die. All you can do is hope. If all you've got at home is a bunch of missiles and a bunch of the writings of Thomas Aquinas and Thomas Akempis, of course you can't know where you're going to go when you die. They didn't know either. If all you've got at home on your bookshelf is a bunch of books by a bunch of liberals like uh, Norman Vincent Peale and Harry Emerson Fosdick and Eugene Carson Blake and Sockman and Ockman and Weigel and Weatherhead and that bunch, of course you can't know for sure. You can hope for the best. But religions don't teach you can know for sure. If you're a Buddhist, you get rid of your karma by following the Noble Eightfold Path and then hope you make it after a few reincarnations. If you're a Confucianist, you keep the Analects and you obey your parents and reverence the spirit of your ancestors and you hope for the best. If you're a Roman Catholic, you find the Church of Christ founded, at least according to what they tell you, and then you take the sacraments and hope for the best. If you're a Protestant, you keep the Golden Rule and the Ten Commandments as much as you're able and hope for the best. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, you trust what Christ did, and you know. And that's the difference. Now, some of you people think I'm just talking. Why don't you try me for size? If you think I'm a hot air expert, why don't you try me out? Why don't you just quit trusting your righteousness this morning and trust Christ's righteousness and see what happens? I got sick and tired of these bull shooters always worried about preachers shooting the bull. If you think I'm a bull shooter, what kind of a bull shooter you are are you, and you won't even try what I tell you to try. If you think I'm wrong, why don't you try me out? Instead of trusting your good works and your religion, your sacrament, and all your junk, why don't you just give it up and trust what Christ did for you and see if I know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Now, proof's in the pudding, boy. Nothing like being objective and empirical and scientific in this modern objective age, man. You just bet your boot is. Well, now you take your Bible and turn to First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. While well, these folks talk about being objective to the most subjective people in this world. Folks talking about being liberal and broad-minded, the most narrow-minded bigots that ever live. Some of them are so narrow-minded if they went down the edge of a razor blade, they look like a ball bearing on a four-lane highway. Now you take First Thessalonians 5, 23. I pray, God, your whole body, soul, and spirit, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithfully, he that calls you also will do it. 
Now listen, if you're going to know what happens to you when you die, first of all, you've got to know what you are. Uh, do you ever stop thinking about this? In this town, you probably have 200 doctors that are trying to help people out, and they don't know what people are. Do you ever think about this? You've got a United Nations Assembly meeting every couple of months, and they're trying to figure out mankind's problems, and the nuts don't know what a man is. What could be funnier than a shrink trying to help you out when he doesn't know what you are? You're a body and a soul and a spirit, according to that book. Look at here, God has a body, Jesus Christ. God has a spirit, God the Holy Spirit. God has a soul, God the Father. Look at here, God made Adam out of the dust of the ground, breathed in the nostrils of breath of life, and it became a living soul. You're a trinity. You have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. That word in Greek for soul looks like this, it's called psuche. That word for spirit looks like this, it's called pneuma or pneumatos. That word for body looks like this, it's a soma. You don't have to know Hebrew or Greek to know those words are different. If you look at them, you can see they're spelled different. <laughs> you see? <laughs> it takes a lot of brains to figure that thing out. You see, body, soul, spirit, they're not the same. They're not the same in English, they're not the same in Greek, they're not the same in Hebrew. You take that thing in Hebrew and look at that thing, that thing for a soul looks like that. It's called a nephesh. They read right to left, backwards. That word for spirit is that, ruach, put that way. That word for body is, you see it on the meat market sometimes, Kosher, basher, kosher meat. The word for carnal, carne, meat, flesh, is that word right there. Now, you don't have to know Hebrew and Greek to know that, because you can see they're spelled different, therefore they're not the same. <laughs> now, fellas, with the spirit and the soul are the same. They couldn't possibly be the same. They're not spelled the same way. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, uh, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder between the soul and the spirit, and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So your soul and your spirit are not the same. What's a soul? An unsafe psychiatrist has no idea what a soul is. That word there, psuche, they use, and that word transliterated looks like that. And you pay money to consult psychics who are psychic and psychologists and psychiatrist, and they've taken a word out of the Bible and turned it into something it's not. That's the word for a soul. That word is the ego, the ego, that's the I am, that's the me. The thing it's you is basically you in distinction from anybody else. For example, in Revelation chapter 6, the souls under the altar cry with a loud voice, a soul has a mouth. Lord, holy and true, how long dost not judge us and avenge our blood upon them and dwell upon the face of the earth? And it was said white robes were given them. A soul can wear clothes. Luke 16, fellows in hell lift up his eyes, being in torment. The soul has eyes. And cried, Father Abraham, have mercy, and send lathers, and tip the finger in water, and cool my tongue. A soul has a tongue, you see. Now, Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and Anaximander and Anaximenes and that bunch of jack legs, they said your soul was something like a peanut or a ball bearing or a croquet ball stuck away in yourself someplace. And the Rosicrucian says, it's in your left ventricle, and when you die, pops out your mouth, out the back of your head. And if you weigh the corpse, you get the vacuum where it leaves, you know. That's a bunch of nonsense. In that Bible, a soul has legs, arms, hands, nose, mo mouth, throat, tongue, lips, jaw, and teeth. There should be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. The fellow said, well, not, I can't gnash my teeth in hell because when I die, I don't have any teeth. <laughs> and a preacher said, Madam, teeth will be provided. <laughs> 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 now, now, you have inside your body a body shape just like this one. The scientists now are beginning to photograph it, and they're getting all shook up. Well, if you had a Bible written 300 years ago, you'd have been prepared. And they got these little electronic vibrations around, the lights going pink and green and blue, you know, and all this stuff. Big deal. Now, listen, if you've got a hand cut off, a couple of months or years after you get that hand cut off, you tell your wife, my fingers itch. And she says, well, uh, your fingers can't itch. You don't have any fingers in that hand. <laughs> and he says, yeah, but my fingers itch. You're the doctor, and the doctor says, it's the nerve endings. Doctors got their problems, too. <laughs> you have inside this body a body just like this one. And this, when you step out of this body and go to hell, you burn good. And you won't burn up. Your soul body is not a physical body, it's a spiritual body. First Corinthians chapter 15. 
You have a body inside this body shaped just like this one, and it's your soul. God has a soul. No man has seen God any time. Jesus said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. There it went. No man has seen God any time. There it went. That sure messes them up, doesn't it? You know, J.W. picks that thing up and says, Well, if nobody's seen the Father but they've seen Christ, then the Father's one God, and Jesus Christ the next one. So that's the J.W. reading you find in the new ASV in John chapter 1, verse 18. Now, holding this oneness says, well, if Jesus is the Father, and he that seen me has seen the Father, then the, Jesus is the Father, and the Holy Spirit is Jesus, and the Father is Jesus? No. The Father is not Jesus. Jesus is a man's name. Jesus said, he has seen me has seen the Father, so he says, well, then the Father's name is Jesus. No, look at here. He that has seen me has seen Pete Ruckman. No man has seen Pete Ruckman any time. you never seen me a day in your life. You say, I'm looking at you. No, you're not. You say, well, I can see you out my two eyeballs. No, you can't. <laughs> you say, well, Ruckman, look at here. All you see is my body. You see it? That's my body. you never seen me. you ever seen me a day in your life. I'm inside my body looking out at you. <laughs> see? And what the devil does is he makes people think they're their bodies. You're not your body. You're in your body. And someday you'll step out of your body. You better take some time for what's in your body. You better take some time with your soul. If some of you people fed your dogs like you feed your soul, your dog would die of malnutrition in two weeks. Now, you see that football? It's got a leather cover, and it's got an inner tube inside, and it's filled with air, and it's three footballs, and it's one. And it's one, but it's three. Three in the one. Three and one, one and three, and the one in the middle died for me. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That isn't a Catholic doctrine. That isn't a Baptist doctrine. That's a Bible doctrine. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What's the Spirit like? It's like wind. How do you know that? Ezekiel chapter 37 says, Come, Son of Man, prophesy to the four winds, and say, Come, O breath, and breathe upon these slain. And he prophesied the four winds, and the Spirit of God came in them, and they stood upon their feet. Christ says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell from whence it cometh, or whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. And that word there, if you translate that Greek word out, it looked like this. Now, you people who have pneumonia, you know what that word is. If you have pneumonia, you have trouble with your wind. Did you ever handle a pneumatic drill, or a pneumatic jack, or a jackhammer? It's compressed air. It's wind. You have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. Now that's the information given by somebody who died and was buried and rose from the dead. And they didn't write some little old funny little cartoon book on life after life and all the stuff for the psychic kiddies. They died and were buried and came up. They didn't lie around the hospital in a coma and then come back. They didn't have the heart stop and the massage the heart and they came to. That's for the kiddies. They didn't lie the hospital all full of drugs so they didn't get a clear picture of what happened to them when they thought they left and hadn't left, or partway left and partway came back. That's for you kiddies. That's for the Girl Scouts that want the buttermilk. This stuff here is written by somebody who died and was stone cold dead three days and in the hole in the ground, and then came back out. <laughs> If you want some life after life and life after death, you better console him and not too, spend too much time with the kiddies. Why, you know, back in the old days when a fellow was in the hospital, he wasn't all doped up with drugs. He couldn't trip if he did die or get in a coma or a cataleptic seizure. Don't kid me. Listen, I've been out the mountains of North Carolina back in the 40s where people died in the homes without the drugs. And when an unsafe fellow dies back there, there isn't anybody in that part of the country that don't believe in hell. And when a saved person dies back there, there isn't anybody in that part of the country that doesn't believe in heaven. Look, we're about half tripping out, half tripping in. I've gone to rooms to pray for people there with a big old cancer in their face you could smell when you came in the room, and I've gone in that room to pray for some old saint. When I came in that room, I couldn't stand on my feet. And it wasn't the smell, it was the presence in that room. I've crawled into those rooms and prayed and crawled back out on my hands and knees and couldn't look up all the time I was in the room. 
I don't care if you're Buddhist, Taoist, relativist, absolutist. I don't give a flip. I'm talking to living people and dead people here this morning. And you people look at me, are they alive or you're dead? He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespass and sin. He that hath the Son hath life. Let the dead bury the dead, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. You hath he quickened who were dead. Let the dead bury the dead. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she yet liveth. Why seek ye the living among the dead? All right, now there. See these two? These are two people before Calvary. They die. What happens to them? The rich man died. The poor man died. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, laid at the gate of the rich man's house, covered with sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the, do the dog came and licked his sores. And it came to pass the beggar died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell with his eyes being in torments. All right, the rich man dies and he is buried and in hell he lifted his eyes being in torments. Where is hell? Hell's down the heart of the earth. He says over there in Amos, he says, though they dig down into hell, Amos 9, 2, yet my hand shall bring them up from hence. Where is hell? It's down under your feet. How do you know that? Matthew chapter 12 says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah 2, verse 2, Jonah says, Out of the belly of hell cried I. Christ goes down through here, comes back up, down under your feet. Down under your feet, there's, it's hell down under your feet, and, and down under your feet, this place is called Sheol. Looks like that. That's not the word for the grave. The grave in Greek looks like this. It's called ne Nehemiah. The word for grave in Hebrew looks like this. It's called Keber. The grave is never Sheol. Sheol is never the grave. There's only one shield. There are millions of graves. All right, hell is down under your feet. What does that mean? That means you take up the tongue and groove and the floorboarding and the, and the cement block, get onto the foundation, go down through sedimentary rock, metamorphic rock, igneous rock, cut down there and get on the bottom. When you get down there after a while, your drill begins to melt. Your drill begins to melt because it's so hot down there, you can't go down any further. Under your feet is a molten nickel, they say, National Geographic. And whatever they say, it's fire, it's under your feet. I know it's in the heart of the earth, Acts chapter 1, verse 27, Acts chapter, or Acts chapter 2, 27, Acts 2, 31. Christ's soul was not left in hell. The part of Christ, it was he himself, the ego, the I me, the I am, Christ's soul was down here three days and three nights, not in the grave, in the heart of the earth. When Christ on Calvary's cross and died, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Where did his spirit go? His spirit went up. What's up? That's heaven. Looks like that in Greek. Looks like that in Hebrew. Shemayim. And he says, Father, and I, he said, I commend my spirit, receive my spirit. His spirit is given up and goes up to heaven. Where does his body go? His body goes down a hole in the ground, lies in the tomb of Joseph by Amathea three days and three nights. Where does his soul go? Acts chapter 231, Acts 227, his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. So his flesh is here, and his soul goes down through here and through here. Now take the unsaved man in the Old Testament. He dies, and he's buried, and in hell. He lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried with a loud voice, said, Father Abraham, have mercy, and send Lazarus, and may dip the tip this thing in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And he said, Son, remember in thy lifetime thou receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil, now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this is a great gulf fixed between us, so we can't get across. That shows you something. That shows you in the Old Testament when the saved fellow died, he did not go to heaven. He couldn't go to heaven. His sins weren't paid for. Hebrews chapter 10, it is impossible the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Back in the Old Testament, the Lord could not take away sin. He says in Exodus chapter 34, The Lord God, long-suffering, full of mercy, goodness, and truth, forgiving iniquity and transgressions, that will by no means clear the guilty. 
in the Old Testament, God could forgive them. God could remit them. But he couldn't clear them, and he couldn't take them away. Why? A completed atonement had not yet been made. Take a saved fellow in the Old Testament when he dies, where does he go? He can't go to hell, he's saved. He can't go to heaven, his sins aren't paid for. He can't go to purgatory, because <laughs> there isn't any purgatory. That's a doctrine an unsaved fellow thought up to try to split the both ends against the middle and take care of his problems without doing it the right way. Now, if you're an unsaved man, you know what you think? You think, well, I'm not bad enough to go to hell. Nobody deserves that, except a few real bad folks. On second thought, we all got bad, so it's probably you. Know, <laughs> and of course, I know I'm not good enough to get to heaven, so I get me a middle place to go. The middle place in the Old Testament is here, and that's in the Old Testament, and it's not purgatory. In the Old Testament, that place is called Abraham's bosom. And the reason why is the earth was given to Abraham as a promise. Romans chapter 4. Abraham's bosom is now on the earth because the earth is given to Abraham, whose earthly descendants have earthly promises for a piece of earth. And when Christ dieth on the cross, he said to the dying thief, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in where? Paradise, not heaven. Paradise. So in the Old Testament, this place is called paradise, or Abraham's bosom. And when Christ dies, he goes down and goes through here. He makes his atonement before he goes down. He doesn't atone for your sins in hell. The atonement is made on the cross. You say, what do you go down through hell for? To dump your sins there. The old Apostles' Creed said he decided, died on the cross and descended into hell. They've taken that out in the last 20 years. How many of you used to repeat that years ago and, and remember that thing, descend into hell? Could I see your hands? Look at that. Forty, fifty people. They took that out. You know why they took that out? They pretended he didn't really go down through hell, but he did. You say, what did he go for? Hebrews chapter 9 says, Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Let me ask you something. Where are your sins right now? If Christ didn't go down to hell, where are your sins? When Christ on the cross, the Bible said, God made him to be sin for us who know no sin, who bore our sins in his own body. He didn't have them on his body when he came up from the dead. What did he do with them? Put them right down here. Christ died, was buried. Ephesians 4 said, He that descended the lower parts of the earth is he also that ascended up on high and led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. When Christ died in Calvary and made the completed blood atonement, he paid for all the sins committed from Adam right on through. My blood, he said, is shed for the remission of sins. That expression, for the remission of sins, only occurs four times in the New Testament. It occurs once in Romans chapter 3, once in Acts chapter 2, once in the, about the baptism of John in Mark chapter 1, and once the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26. And not one single time does that ever mean be baptized so you can get your sins forgiven. It don't mean that one time. Because in the Old Testament, God had been forgiving him and remitting him for 4,000 years. For 4,000 years, God had been remitting sins on the basis of the blood of bulls and goats. You see, when we quote a verse that says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, we're so used to using that in personal work that after a while we give people the idea that is a reference to the blood of Christ. Well, in the context, it's not a reference to the blood of Christ. It's a reference to the Old Testament sacrifices. Now, I'm not telling you to quit using the verse. It's a good verse to use. You see, brethren, what makes good doctrine sometimes is not very good preaching. And what makes good preaching is often not too good a doctrine. I wouldn't hesitate to tell a fellow, it is a point a man wants to die and after this the judgment. I wouldn't hesitate to tell him that. It isn't so, you know, all the way. I mean, Moses died once and will die again, you see. And uh, Lazarus died twice, and Jonah died twice, and Dorcas died twice, and Eutychus died twice, and the widow of Nain's son died twice, and Jairus, see, see what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it is a point a man wants to deny after this. The judgment is a general truth. It's not a doctrinal truth. Oh, and look at here. Back in the Old Testament, God could remit him for 3,000 years, but he couldn't clear him. He couldn't take him away. But Jesus Christ shows up in Calvary's cross. And listen, there's a line right there you can't get around. 
And when Christ dies on the cross, he says, It is finished. Look out for somebody trying to get you down here now. <laughs> That's all over. Look out for somebody trying to get you back here where the priest sprinkles holy water. That's all over. Look out for somebody trying to bring you and make you think that Christ is still in the tabernacle, a little box up here in front of you someplace, and let him out Sunday morning for a little while and then put him back in. That's all over. When Christ says, it is finished, you know what that means? That means, man, it am finished. My redemption is complete. I don't have to go anywhere when I die. If I drop dead right there, you don't have to worry about me. I'm absent the body, present with the Lord. If I hit the floor right now and have a heart attack, you know, blood clot, stroke, whoop, flop over there and left shoulder jump up in the air and feel that old pain going through me and start kicking the ground. You folks start running up here, you know, give them air, stand back, call the ambulance, whoop, 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 whoop. This guy starts up here, you know, I just step out of my body and say, hey, cool it, man, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm all right, don't worry about it. You don't hear a word I'm saying. <laughs> and about that time, two young gentlemen will show up, 33-year-old male, no wings. Oh, yeah, man, that Bible puts a lot of light in the college education. And they'll say, you ready to go? i say, I'm ready to go. <laughs> you talk about leaving? We're going to leave. <laughs> that Bible says, angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them that shall be heir of the salvation. Now, some of that stuff you read in life after life matches that. And what matches that is right, and what doesn't match that is the doctor's drugs. But that stuff was make, written to make you think that nobody goes to hell. I've got, a, I've got a beautiful book at home written by a doctor from Tennessee, and he got mad at that fellow who wrote that book in Life After Life, so he wrote one, and he gave the testimonies of the fellows who stepped out of the body and saw the lake of fire and stepped back in. I don't imagine his book will sell too well. <laughs> All right, now this thing here, when Christ says it is finished, it is finished. Now, now I, if I am rude and uncouth and brutal about these things, it's because in dealing with people through years and years and years and years and years and years, I've learned something. I've learned there are some people in this world that profess to want love when you give it to them, they don't want it. And they profess to want tact and diplomacy and sweetness and kindness, and when you give it to them, they spit in your face. There's some people on this earth, no matter how you serve the meal, they don't want it. So what I do is put it over the plate waist high, and if you want to swing, swing, and if you don't, you get called out after three of them. <laughs> now, I suppose I made that piano over there. I couldn't make nothing like that for love and the money. But suppose I took me 15 years to make a piano like that, and I put it out for sale, and about the time I got it out in the street for sale, you came by and kicked it and chipped it and hacked at it and put gasoline on it and set fire to it and slapped that with an axe. And I came out there and said, man, what you doing to my piano? And you said, I'm putting the finishing touches on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, why, you fool, is finished before you ever got to it. See what I mean? I mean, when Christ is hanging the cross, he says, it is finished. Now, you know what you're going to add to it? A great big mess. <clears throat> you little old golden rule, you little old sacraments, you little old beads, you little old good deeds, <laughs> little old books you got out in the library, treat your fellow man right, and don't hurt anybody just as long as you live up to what you are and know yourself and be true to yourself or your little junk. And listen, when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. You can't add anything to it that God will accept. You're just kidding yourself. Oh, now you take over here this side. Take these two over here. Times have changed. You get across Calvary, there's a change. For example, there's nobody left in Abraham's bosom. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, when Christ ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He says in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, he says, The graves were opened, and the bodies of many of the saints that slept came out and were seen in the city following his resurrection. Old Testament saints can now get up here. What does that mean? That means paradise was transferred. Paradise was down under your feet, now it's over your head. Where do you find that? Not in the college education, it isn't there. Where do you find that? It isn't the National Geographic magazine. It isn't the American Scientific Journal. If you had an association here for the advancement of science, you wouldn't find two men in the whole group that know anything about it all. If you had Gene Dixon here with a prophecy and Edgar Casey with his prophecy, they wouldn't know enough about prophecy to find that thing. They could no more find that thing. They could find a bowling ball in a bathtub. That thing's in a Bible. 
It isn't in the sutras. It isn't in the Vedas. It isn't in the Bhagavad Gita. It isn't in the Analects of Confucius. It isn't in the Shastas. It isn't in the Puranas. It isn't in the Tripitaka, the Triple Basket. It isn't there. Because whoever wrote those things didn't know what was going to happen. Whoever wrote this book knew what was going to take place. All right, now they're up, they're gone. How do you know paradise is up now? Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, body I cannot tell, God knows. Such a one was caught up in the paradise, up, up, caught up in the paradise, and heard words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Changed. All right, now step over here and we'll finish it up. I'll let this figure here represent an unsaved man. Where does he go when he dies? Well, there isn't one verse in the New Testament that lead anybody to think he goes any place except straight to hell. The condition of unsaved people isn't changed before or after Calvary. As a matter of fact, it's not even changed before or after the tribulation. Unsaved people in that Bible are said to stay down to the last resurrection of the unsaved did, and they don't come up to the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20. You say, where can you get that information? Not in an Encyclopedia Britannica. It isn't there. Not in an Encyclopedia Americana. It isn't there. Not in Gwyneth's Book of Records. It isn't there. Not in the 1979 Almanac. It isn't there. You can have a college education and 30 years of postgraduate work and have no more idea what you're doing than a bat flying in blind backwards. That Bible says the unsaved dead stay down. They come up with the white throne judgment. Their condition hadn't changed. Unsaved men die. They go to hell. I believe that. Brother Rawling believes that. He believed that all his life. If he didn't believe that, he wouldn't be here, and this work wouldn't be here. But I was telling you last time I was here, folk get living around this stuff, and they say, what's all this for? You're trying to get people saved. That's the idea. They're going to hell. That's the idea, you see. You lose that idea, you lose the whole idea to start with. I mean, there's a lot of money spent here. Oh, what's all this fancy equipment, all these fine lights, all these nice pews, and getting you know, what's, what's the thing all about, man? Somebody said, well, just tell folks how to live a good life. Oh, go on, you can get that anywhere. Get that on a newsstand. You know what this thing is? This thing here is get a bunch of folks together and get them praying together and preaching together and testifying together to get out there and make an impact upon a godless, pagan, hell-bound world to pull brands out of the burning from that world outside there. That's what it's doing here. And it wouldn't be this nice if you weren't spoiled. <laughs> See, but Americans spoil rotten. <laughs> Well, if some of you didn't have these nice seats here, some of you wouldn't even be sitting here this morning. Amen, 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 amen. If all you have in this place was folding chairs, a hundred of you wouldn't even be here today. Amen, amen, amen. I'll tell you, you have to have air conditioning, too. Bunch of spoiled Americans, man. You've got to have the right kind of lights. You've got to spend a million dollars to take care of these spoiled Americans who used to be in the spoiled just to get them where they ought to be. Where you ought to be is rooted and grounded in the faith and know where you're going when you die and be able to tell another man and be out there telling them. That's what it's all about. And if I know what it's about, this is a waste of money. I think fellows go to hell. I think if you're here an unsaved man and you go to hell, you're going to burn like a torch. I believe that. Uh, sometimes I'm burdened about that. Sometimes I'm not. I wish I could be as burdened I'm supposed to be. Sometimes I guess I'm kind of like the Lord. Sometimes when he was burdened about it, he just yelled at him. <laughs> Sometimes he wept over Jerusalem. Other times he said, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? He wouldn't stand there saying, oh, you serpents, oh, you generation of vipers, how can you escape? No, no, uh -uh. no, no, uh -uh. see. People think that every time man preaches about hell, he has to be weeping. Well, maybe he should be, but you don't. You know, in the ministry, you get kind of hard. I know I do. I get kind of professional and hard about it at times. After, by the time you've seen 50,000 people turn down the Lord, give you all these smart answers, you get tough, you know. In hot water all the time, you get hard-boiled. <laughs> and I wish I could always be, you know, you'd be sweet, you know, and burdened about it, but I'm not. You know, back in the old days, I'd tell a fellow to go to hell and he'd laugh at me. Now I'd try to tell him how to stay out of hell and he gets mad at me. It's a strange thing, isn't it? I'll be when a fellow dies, he goes to hell. I'll be if some of you going to go to hell, baby, you're going to burn. I'm not in favor of it. I wish you wouldn't. I hope you don't. I'm praying you won't. We'll give you a chance this morning to turn from your way and not go to hell, but some of you going to make it. 
There's something less bitter, and I don't care what I say, what he says, or what his sons say, or what the visiting speaker says. There are going to be people coming to this building and go out, and go right on the lake of fire, and just burn like a torch. You're smart. You're smart enough, dumb, hillbilly preachers. See, you know so much more than we do. You're going to work it out your way. See, I hope you don't. But if you got your mind made up, till it dies, goes to hell. I believe that. I'm like an old Irish preacher one time. They brought a corpse around him, asked him to bury it. He said, I'll not bury that man. And they said, why not? He said, I talked to him about his soul many times. And he said, uh, he cursed me and cursed God and cursed the Bible. And right before he died, he said, to hell with your whole bag of tricks. And somebody said, well, somebody's got to bury him. And he said, I'll not pronounce the sacred words over him. He said, he lived damned and he died damned and he is damned right now in hell and I'm going to open the Bible over his grave. If we had more preachers like that, it'd be a different kind of a country, you know that? Amen. You know, back in the old days, a sinner couldn't find any rest. Back in this country, 70, even 70 years ago, a fellow came to a Baptist church, he'd go out the door with his tail scorched, and he'd go out there with, with salt and brimstone coming off his coattails, and he'd go out there and say, I'm never going back here again. <laughs> you go down to the Methodist church, try to get some relief. <laughs> <laughs> that Methodist study, man, you not only can't do nothing to get saved, but after you get saved, you better live right. You go to hell after you get saved. Woo, man, he'd leave there. He'd run down the Presbyterian church, so I'd get some relief down here. It's worse down there. That guy stand up and say, if you're elected to be damned and reprobated to be damned, you're just as good as damned right now. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Woo, how'd he go out of there? You know, back in the old days, a sinner couldn't find their rest in America. But there's so many preachers that sold God out now, and this sucker can kind of fool the trying to find a fool to, you know, polish his boots, you know, and kiss his foot. But it gets in a conviction now, he can go out of here, and within less than five miles of this church, he can find somebody to just soothe him and pat his back till he just purrs like a cat. The fellow dies, he goes to hell. I believe that. Back in World War II, a troop ship was going overseas, and they got near one of those islands out there for an invasion, and the chaplain got up there on the uh, deck to make a little speech, and some hillbilly down there in the forward hat said, Preacher, before you go as a preacher, let me ask you one question. The preacher said, What's that? The chaplain did. And that Arkansas hillbilly said, Does you believe they's a hell or don't you? He said, Of course I don't. I'm a 20th century enlightened man. And the hillbilly said, We don't want to hear you preach yet. And the chaplain said, Why not? And the hillbilly said, Because if they's a hell, you lying. We don't want to hear no liar preach. And if there ain't no hell, what do we need you preaching to us for anyway? <laughs> Amen, 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 and amen. That's the truth, brother. That's the truth. The fellow dies, he goes to hell. He's burning. There are people down there have been burning for 2,000 years. They're still burning. When you get to hell, you'll burn good. You won't burn up. You can't burn up a soul. A soul isn't physical. You'll just burn and burn and burn and burn and burn. I don't say that with relish. I don't say that in joy. I had a mother and father die without Christ. I had a sister and an aunt and uncle die without Christ. I get no satisfaction out of what I'm saying. Some of you folks think I do. You're kind of sadistic yourself to think that. I get no satisfaction out of that. I'm just telling you because some of you are just so set in your ways. Some of you don't tell it to you like that, you're never going to get it. Hugh Pyle, Hugh Pyle tells a story I'll never forget about a fellow out in Texas, a hardware man who ran a hardware store, was a godless blasphemous type of fellow. And everybody tried to witness to him. Nobody got anywhere with him. And one day at a church out there, they had a church dummy. You know, almost every big church has a, has a fellow, you know, that around, hanging around has his pilot light blown out, you know, to kind of keep you humble. I have several like that. <laughs> like a fellow. Like a fellow. So we got some young people going off to school this year that need to be an institution. <laughs> and this fellow, and this, this church dummy, he went down this hardware man and stopped right in front of him and said, Say, he said, you want to go to heaven? I where a man said, no, I don't. And he said, okay, go to hell and walk out the door. <laughs> and the next Sunday, that fellow showed up at church and called the pastor aside, went back in the office and sat down, well-dressed businessman, and said, you know, he said, uh, I'm, I'm kind of upset about my spiritual condition. He said, uh, one of your members witnessed another day, and he said, uh, I hadn't quite seen it in that light before. <laughs> I thought I just told him the truth. The truth is, you're going to burn. 
That's the truth. Now look at here. Here's a saved man. What happens to him when he dies? Paul says, I'm in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, knowing when we're present in the body, we're absent from the Lord, we're confident, say, and willing rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, gain, gain. To depart and be with Christ is not just better, far better, far better. A Christian is better off dead than alive. Paul is kind of a suicidal maniac. Nobody that was trying to be careful could get as much trouble as he got into. He's trying to get the stone, get on home to glory. He got a glimpse of it in Second Corinthians chapter 12, never forgot it. Do you take that thing right there? If you were to die right now and you're a child of God, the undertaker gets your body, he wouldn't get your soul. That Bible says in Genesis 35, when Rachel died, her soul was in departing. Departing. Paul said, the time of my departure is at hand. You know, if I offered you $150 million, I couldn't offer you something as good as I'm offering you right now. And I'll just give two illustrations and have done with it. Down there in Baymanet, Alabama, where I lived for years, there was an old Methodist preacher named Duck. He had a boy named Ernest. When old man Duck got to be about 80 and his son was about 60, the old man began to have heart attacks and comas and this and that. And one day out there in a wheelchair out behind the house in the garden patch, he said, Ernest, he said, I'm going today. I'm going to leave you, boy. And he said, Daddy, you've been saying that now a couple of weeks. And the old man said, yeah, but I'm going home today. And the doctor came, gave him some shots and stuff. He lingered about two more days. And about the third day, he said, Ernest, I'm going to leave you today. I'm going home. And he said, Daddy, I'll call the doctor. And old man Duck said, no, you just call that fool doctor. I'm leaving this time. And the doctor came there, and they sat around the backyard after giving him some shots and stuff and talked a while. And that old Methodist preacher looked out across that garden a couple of minutes, and his eyes lit up, and he said, My, my. He said, Look at that room. Isn't that a beautiful room? I never saw a room like that before in all my life. And then he turned to his son, and he said, What made me say that? Ernest said, I don't know, Daddy. And about a minute later, that old fellow turned to that doctor and his son and said, Bye-bye. <laughs> and <coughs> go on like that. Go on like that. Now listen, you consider yourself fortunate if you go like that. Down there in Pensacola, I had a family there in a church called Shavers. He and his wife had been married 65 years. He's up around 90 someplace, and one day after dinner, both in good health, he's about 90, she's about 84, he got up and went and lay down on the couch, take a little nap, and he said to his wife, he said, I sure feel good. He lay there a while, and he said, you know, honey, he said, I don't know what's wrong with me, I just feel so good. I just haven't felt so happy in all my life. Then closed his eyes, and five minutes later, he's dead. Now listen, that's what it's all about. See, that's the finish. We look real good here, sitting here with our nice clothes on, you know, nice manners, and Carl that junk out there. But that ain't what it's about, you see. <laughs> you see, one day, they're going to have you up in the hospital, and you're going to have nothing left, that little dinky linen thing they put on you, and your kid's going to be fighting over your money. And the lawyers and the doctors are going to get the rest. That's right. Going to take your dead body and wash it and... You know, ram something up on your arm, something in your leg, you're sucking out of you, and then dress you up like a doll and put you in a box. You. <laughs> you, and 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 all us. <laughs> and listen, when that time comes, all the stuff you've done, all the stuff you are, won't be worth 15 cents alongside faith in the finished blood atonement of Jesus Christ when that time comes, because that's what will get you where you ought to be. Redemption. The new Bible say in Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. That isn't true. You have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption's over here. Remission's over here. They're not the same. If you have a translation that leads out through his blood, you have a devil's Bible that tried to make the Old Testament and the New Testament the same and get around the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. You can't do it. Remission is not redemption. Redemption is not remission. They're remitted, but not redeemed. When they're redeemed, they're redeemed through his blood. King James, Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. All right, one of these days, what's going to happen? 
I saw a great white throne, him that sat upon it, from whose face the heaven and earth fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in them, and death and hell delivered the dead which were in them, and they would judge every man according to his works. And whoever is not found in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now you see what God did here? God took the saints in paradise and took them out of paradise and put them up into heaven. And one day the Lord going to take the unsaved people in hell and take them out of hell and put them in the lake of fire. Or as they say out in the world, out of the frying pan into the fire. That's how it goes. Now folks say, well, I believe when I die, God will give me a second chance. Yes, he will. You'll have your second chance right there. You stay in hell for the tribulation, you'll stay in hell for the millennium, and the Lord, Lord, Lord will haul you up and give you a second chance. If you want to call out a second chance, take it. As for me, I'm not going to fool with it. I wouldn't think of taking a chance, thing like that. Now you folks want to take a chance, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to be, I mean, I'll prophesy for you. I mean, Gene Dixon isn't going to even come close to cutting it. You're going to stand out like this. Look down at your feet, nothing under your feet for 20, 50 million years, light years. Just out there in the universe where the solar system has passed away, no earth to stand on, nothing under your feet. And you'll face a light you can't look at. You'll hear a voice like the sound of many waters. And when you look down under your feet and see what's holding you up, the thought will finally get through your head. The only reason I'm standing here is because the Word of God is sustaining me. And if the Word of God didn't sustain me, I'd drop. Now, some of you don't know that right now, but you'll get the message then. I get it right now, see? I understand standing here. The only reason I'm talking to you and looking at you and breathing is because God is holding me up. That's the only thing. And if the Lord said, okay, Pete, drop, I'm gone, man. I'm gone. You'll be standing out there like that, look up like that, face the record. Nice TV, cinemascope, high fidelity, stereo, tweeter woofer, uh, panorama in full color up there. Everything you've ever said and done and thought, you see, wherever it come, well, you've got a brain, all the impressions are right there. All the Lord has to do is just haul them back and play them back. You'll be your own judge. And that stuff come out there, and then the Lord will see whether you've got a chance or not. When that thing's over, the Bible says, the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend, every head shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. I thank God that although uh, preachers like uh, me and your pastor, and we're, we're considered to be pretty rough these days, and pretty uncouth by this generation of Girl Scouts and tenderfeet, I thank God with all the cussing out we get, we're on the winning side. And we're going to live to see a day where every man, woman, and child we preach is a convert. Now, we're going to stand and sing an invitation hymn here in a minute. And I hope you've got the grace and the good sense before you leave here today to get up out of your seat and come down and bend the knee here at a padded altar in a comfortable building in a rich country. Amen. See? Now, if you won't, and it's a free country, man. I can't make you. If you won't, you can come up there and bow the knee, and say, Jesus is Lord, but you will bow the knee, Philippians 2. Mohammedan, Buddhist, Taoist, Confucius, Protestant, Roman Catholic, Absolutist, Relativist, Empiricist, Existentialist, every one of you, someday, will be converted to Jesus Christ. Now, the best time right now. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer.